I just, I just, I found that. I thought, you know, I got to show that because it relates to the sermon. It really does. As a matter of fact, I, I changed the whole sermon to go around that commercial just because I wanted to use it. Uh, I, the message is obviously that if you wear diapers, you're happy. I mean, that's obvious what the message is. You know, <laughs> really, it is huggies. If you're wearing diapers, you're going to be happy. But um, it's got something to do with tension. Well, we've been going through life apps today, this this uh, this month, and. And the life apps, remember, the, the core of it is that, that James one twenty two passage, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And, and we looked at forgiveness, and man, that was, that was rough to, to forgive others the same way that we're forgiven. And then we looked at last week at confession. That was not an easy thing, that if we want to break free from what we've been trapped in, that we need to talk to somebody, we need to tell somebody else. And, and, and come come out with it. And today, um, as we've announced, the topic is rest, and that's related to tension. And, you know, I don't think that I need to sell today that we are <clears throat> probably feeling more rushed and more tense than what we were five years ago. Part of that, for some of you younger ones, is just kind of getting older. You know, you just kind of get some kids, and, and the job starts pushing you a little bit more, and you, you find those you find those pressure points in life and it starts getting rough. But with all the time-saving inventions that we have and technology, it's just really strange that we feel like we've got less time now than what people did five years ago. And I just think it's kind of a given today that there's going to be a certain amount of, of tension. There's going to be a certain amount of pressure in your life uh, because of the culture in which we live. And people are working uh, more than ever, and it seems that we um, that the competition is just kind of ratcheting up. The expectations are getting higher for most of us, and you know our our weekends are shrinking. It seems like it used to be that weekends, well, at least when you were you know two or three years old, like those kids, that just you know just don't worry, be happy, and and now you get to the weekend, and there's maybe a to do list on the weekend of things that you got to get done, and it's not like work from the office or work from your job, but still it's stuff that you got to do. And, you know, um, we're just feeling more and more stress and rest has become some kind of dream, you know, that we used to used to enjoy when we were in college and you could sleep in all day and stay up as late as you wanted and, and just kind of bomb out for a while. But now people dream about sleeping. You know, they think about sleeping. Oh, if I could just get eight hours of sleep, this would be fantastic. And, and one uh, major reason why people give, I mean, people who consider themselves to be Christ followers, and the reason that they don't go to church on Sunday morning, and the reason why this place isn't filled today is because they need to rest. And, you know, I understand that. I, you know, I, I can understand if you were working a job, and then you get to the weekend, and your Saturday's filled with, you know, getting things around the house, and you get to Sunday morning, and it's raining, and, well, you know, Sleep's pretty good, and I need it, and I, I understand that whole tension. And uh, you know, just grab a few more hours. And being busy is kind of the new normal for us, in in our culture. It, it really is. And for the most part, if we're not busy, we we might think that uh, we're just not important, you know. Because if you're if you're important, you're going to have your calendars full, and and you're, you're going to every moment's taken up. And I'm not sure if I can work that in. And that's kind of what the culture tells us an important person is, is somebody that's, that's got a lot of demands, a lot of tension. And, and, it, and uh, it used to be that the culture pushed us to rest. I mean, come Sunday, uh, there's not many of us in the room, but a few of us can remember when Sunday was the most boring day of the week and you couldn't wait to get to Monday. Really? Because Sunday, there wasn't anything to do. I mean, you went to church and that was it, but the gas stations were closed, the stores were closed, the theaters were closed, everything was closed. And I mean, it was dull. Trust me. Sunday afternoon was kind of like this homesick kind of feeling where you just, you know, you got carted off to grandma and grandpa's and, you know, they, they watched Lawrence Welk while you, I don't know, played dominoes or something. It, 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 was, it was really just a boring time. And I remember those days, but the, but the whole culture was pushing towards rest then. And now the whole culture is pushing anti-rest. 
You know, where Sunday, if, if you would go, well, maybe not this morning because it's raining, but later on, you go to Kroger. It's the biggest day of the week there, ex except for Wednesday's senior day. You know, it's, it's the biggest day of the week. The place is packed with people that are, that are there doing their stuff on Sunday. And, and we, you know, that's the way the, the cultures push it. But today rest is really kind of undervalued, I think, because... We've been really weakened in our ability to, to produce, and, and this is really where I want to go, to produce fruit for the kingdom that comes out of being restored in rest. And today, I'm not bashing work um, because we were created and we were commanded to be productive. We don't want to forget that. You realize the first commandment that was given by God to human beings was to work. That was the first commandment that was given. Working hard's not bad. Working hard's a very good thing. Uh, in the beginning, we see that God created the human beings with the purpose and the design of being productive. They were made to do more than just exist. Uh, Genesis 1, 27 to 28, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful. An increase in number, boy, we've heard that command here, and fill the earth, <laughs> subdue it, says, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every, every living creature that moves on the ground. So work is God's design. He, he says, be fruitful, fill the earth, rule, subdue the earth, take dominion. All those things are actions. You know, it's not just hanging out and seeing what's going to happen in life. But God gives this immediate, this first command. God designed us to work. God designed us to be productive. It's a very good thing. And the first humans were placed in the garden, remember, where they were working. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Work's God's idea. Sometimes you hear people say, well, work is because of the fall, because of the curse. Well, that makes work nasty. But, but work was always in the plan. So, so don't think that, that working is evil or bad. In fact, if, if you want to see how God feels about work, just you know, pull up Bible Gateway on, on your computer and put in lazy or sluggard. Those are two words that are used in the Bible. And, and you'll see what God thinks about people that are lazy and called sluggards. It's not, it's not good, but work is good. But work's not all that there is. From the very beginning, there was created this rhythm to be in life. In fact, God rested. It tells us that in Genesis 2, 2, that after he created everything for six days, that God rested. And God wasn't tired. It wasn't like, wow, you know, that was rough. I've got to catch my breath. No, God rested as a model for us as to how life, was be, how life would be. And he declared, remember, that, sixth, that seventh day to be holy. It was to be a, a different kind of day than the other, other days. And it, the, the seventh day was so different that he says, it's going to make my top ten list. It's going to put it right there with things like murder and stealing and lying. And he says, rest is extremely important. And he declared that seventh day to be a day of rest, and, and he declared the seventh year to be uh, a year of rest. Uh, we, we don't talk about that or, or practice that. Can you imagine that, of working six years at a job? I mean, a lot of people dream about Friday afternoons. Just think you've worked at this job for six years, and now you get the seventh year off with pay. Wow! Isn't that a great design? I mean, why don't we do things that way again, Right? You've worked six years, and now you take... The only people that do that are academics. You know, they get the sabbatical. You've heard of sabbatical. I got a sabbatical one time because I just got so tired and mean. The church said, you've got to leave for a while. You know, after, after about uh, 10 years of just being ornery with them, they said, you need to go away. You really do. But that's the whole, that was the whole plan. And God had multiple reasons uh, that he gave for the day and the year of rest. And one reason was that it was a sign of the covenant. Remember, this is the covenant sign that I gave to Moses, that you'll keep one day, and every, 
every Saturday for the Hebrew people, they'd come around that Saturday and they'd go, man, we have got a great God. Because we only work six days, everybody else works seven. But we only have to work six because God gave us a day off. Isn't that fantastic that we're Hebrews? You know? And that's the way that was the plan. But the other reason was that God had made human beings with this, this need for rest, this need to do something different from work. And it was to be a time for, for joy and celebration, not just a time to be bored, you know, like we were practicing it back in the 60s. But it was to be a time when the body would be rested and there would be restoration and there was, there was time for fellowship with other people and, and relationship building. Resting on one day a week became the single greatest identity for the Hebrew people and because God rested and God gave us this day of rest. Now, having said that, I want us to understand that rest is a spiritual discipline. In most books that talk about the spiritual disciplines, rest is included right there along with prayer and meditation and fasting and study and things like that, things that help us grow spiritually. Rest is included along with those other things. So when someone is home on Sunday afternoon and they are on the couch and they're snoring, okay, they are being very spiritual. <laughs> See, I told you you're going to like his sermon. Yeah. They really are. They're, they're being very spiritual. That's true. It's no less... You know, for some reason, especially in our culture right now, and, and not, not just our culture, but some others, but, but we've changed from being human beings where there are times where we just are there. You, you know what that is? You, you probably have times when you're just there. Maybe you get really tired and somebody talks to you and they go, what are you thinking about? And you go, absolutely nothing. I'm just existing. I'm just here. Okay. Well, everybody, some of you have that a lot more than others, but, but, but you know what that is to just be, to just be present. I don't have an agenda. I don't have a to-do list for this next hour or two hours, but I'm just simply here. That's called being a human being. And a lot of times, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're changing it into be human doings, where I've got to be doing something. I've got to be functioning. I've got a to-do list. I have to feel productive. And God says, no. Be a human being. Just, just be there. It's no less. And I think sometimes we have difficulty receiving that. And, and that gets down to a, just a core faith issue. Do I believe God's promises and the way that God has made me in His image or not? We think that everything should be work and there should be pressure and tension. And when that isn't there, we wonder, am I being productive? Am I, am I really being an important person or not? Now, I want to put a, a little diagram up here on the screen. Uh, we might consider, this is so simple, we might consider God's created rhythm of life to be kind of like this image, this half circle with a pendulum in the middle that swings back from work to rest. And every day and every week and every year, this pendulum swings back and forth between rest and work. It's, it's in the rest that we get the energy to do the work, right? But if we don't go back to this place of being restored, then we can't be productive. And I'm not talking about just performing at work, although that really affects our effectiveness at work, you know, so much. But, but it's in everything in life, what we are as parents, what we are in our relationships, what we are with other people, what we are in the kingdom of God, comes off of this time of being at rest. And I kind of think of it as being one of those old clocks with the pendulum that you know, clicks back and forth. You have one of those. Man, they're killers. You know, they used to make noise all night. My, my grandmother had one. Is like, shut the thing up, would you? You know, so good. But it's click, 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 back that pendulum, back and forth. And that's, and that's the way that life is designed to be, is to have this rhythm to it. Some of us don't have much rhythm, okay? Some of us had more rhythm than what maybe we've got now. You know, uh, it's, it's possible to, I was thinking about this the other day, if I had to go and dance right now, what would I dance like? I'd probably go back to those moves that I had in eighth grade, you know, is the way I'd try to dance. But you kind of forget some of those dance moves, you know, and it's the same way with rhythm. Sometimes we get completely out of rhythm. 
But this is God's created plan. When we, when we live for work, when we uh, neglect the rest, uh, then we get off balance. And the work begins to suffer, our productivity in every area of life. Not, I say work, I really mean productivity. Every area of life begins to diminish, and we no longer have the energy. And we, we try to work from a, a point of depletion. And when we do that, we're really kind of, we don't think about this, but we're kind of living like we know more than God knows. We're saying, well, you made everybody else like that, but actually I'm immune from that. I've got this special immunity pill that I took, and I don't really need as much rest as everybody else. I know everybody else needs rest, but I don't really need it that way. And, and really what that's doing is we're pretending to be God. We're saying I've, I've made myself. But a, a godless culture, and, and all cultures are godless to some degree, celebrates and gives praise to people who are the most tense, who have the most going on. And it's difficult for us to, to consider ourselves to be valuable if we are not working more than what we should work. So today there's a, a great need of, of men and women who, uh, even in the church, move in their ministry from, uh, from this resource of rest. And the church oftentimes, you know, when I was a young pastor, I would hear, well, I'd rather uh, burn out than rest out. You know, that's what I'd, you got to go strong for Jesus. We got plenty of time to rest in heaven. And you'd hear those kind of things. And, you know, most of those people, you know, a thousand pastors a week, drop out of ministry, a thousand a week. And, you know, I don't suffer from this anymore, but I did from a, for a while. Uh, there was a time when I really kind of burnt out, wasn't a, a, a good time in life. And even as I say that, I'm kind of proud now that I worked so hard and I was so important that I could burn out. You know what I mean? You get in this strange thing where you value how tense you are. But it's not just a pastor thing. You know, many of us in church kind of get in this thing where, you know, we've got so much pressure that we just kind of give God the leftovers. We just work out of rhythm. It's, we don't have the rhythm in life anymore. And rest is a spiritual issue. God created there to be rhythm in life. Now, here's something I ran into that really got my attention. A survey was given to a thousand kids, grades three through 12, and they were asked this question, what would you ask for if you had one wish for something connected to your mom and dad's work that affected your life? One wish that you're gonna get that's connected to your mom and dad's work. Well, most of us, you know, I think, well, what they're gonna ask for is more time, right? They ask for more time. So they asked the parents the same question, 600 parents were asked what they thought their kids would say to that question. And what would you think your child would say if they just had one wish to, to receive for something to do with your work? And the majority um, of the parents said, well, they're going to want more time with us. And that's not what the kids said. 10% of the kids said, I want uh, more time with moms. 15.5% uh, said they wanted more time with dads. But the majority, the majority said, I want mom and dad to have less stress and to be less tired. I, that just, man, that broke my heart. I think of kids are saying, you know, no, my first thing is and I want them here more. I just, when they're here, I want them to have less stress and be less tired. You know, we think the battle in our culture is over things like drugs and, and promiscuity and, and moral issues. I don't think that's where the battle is. I think the battle is right here. Um, we, we think that those areas are where the wars take place, but, you know, neglecting the way that we were made, going through life off balance, going through life pretending that I can, I can be depleted and depleted and still be productive in my relationships with Lord, with the Lord at work and all these areas. 
and thinking, I'm immune, you know. God made me different from every other person, and I can do this. I'm superhuman. And in that depleted state, we're the only ones really who believe it. Everybody else knows that we're depleted. <laughs> they really do. When, when you're depleted, everyone else knows what you're running on. We're the only ones that it's hidden from. We have trouble seeing it ourselves. And I think we've got to fight for this. We must restore the space into life where there are times for me to waste. Where, you know, what did you do today? Nothing. Well, don't you feel bad that you didn't do anything? Now, now let, let me put a disclaimer in here. Some of us really need to do more than what we're doing. You know, I, I, don't, want, I don't want anybody that's sitting here that's, that's under that sluggard category, and I don't know who you are, but, I, but anyway, the, there's some of us, you know, that need to do some more. We'll, we'll, we'll close on that. But most of the time, people know that we're tense. Now, we have the best model ever for life in Jesus. He says, live like I lived and you will have an abundant life. If, if you walk like I walk, okay, then you're going to experience the same kind of joy, the same experiences that I had. And, and, and we get this sometimes a little mixed up too. We say, well, we're going to remember what you said and we're going to put it on the wall and we're going to put it on the refrigerator. And oh man, look at what he said up here. But when it comes to walking what he walked, we go, well, he's Jesus, he's God. I can't walk the way he walked. But uh, he came teaching and he came living life, the life of rest. And the time he came, there were all these ridiculous laws about the Sabbath, about that Saturday of rest, and um, how people kept that day became... Uh, the sign of how good they were and how holy they were, and they just got things, they just went a little crazy with it. They just went way overboard on the whole Sabbath thing, and they just kind of twisted it around to being a time of tension and pressure. You got to Sabbath, and oh my, you can't do that, and you can do this, and it wasn't a time to re relax or rest, but it was a time of tension. And Jesus, he practiced the Sabbath, but this is what he said, uh, Mark 2, 27 to 28. He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Well, that's it's an economy of words there. He says so much. Okay, You weren't made to keep the Sabbath. God gave you the Sabbath. This is for you. Jesus says, God's not testing you. God's not seeing which ones of you are holy and which ones aren't holy. He wants to give you this day off to have joy and celebration and rest. You need this. Enjoy it. It's, it's a holy day. It's a holy day to celebrate and, and just, you know, enjoy yourself. Recharge your lives. This is God's gift to you. And for us to be productive, we have to live from this reservoir of rest. And that's, that's what he did. You know, you, you may never have noticed it, but Jesus took uh, a lot of times when he would uh, go away by himself and rest. If you just read like in the first chapter of Mark, and I'm not quoting any of those, but, but that's the best place to go is the first from chapter 2 through 6. I think there's six different times where he went away and rests. But that's his rhythm. And we're, we're to uh, have this life where we rest and we recover and we replenish, and then we get re-engaged again. But there has to come a time for us to disengage from what's going on so we can rest. And while, while when I say rest, and I don't just mean a nap, um, a time of rest may not be really a physical rest. The time of rest is a time when you're, you're disengaged, when, when you're not checking your email, when you're not looking at your to-do list, when you're not taking calls but you're just disengaged from other things. And when we rest, then we recover. Uh, our balance comes back. We begin to see that the world doesn't rest on my shoulders. As a matter of fact, after you've rested for a while, your shoulders will even lighten up a little bit and your neck won't be so stiff. And things just kind of return back to that little huggies uh, form of life that we saw at the beginning where everything's, you know, you don't worry and you be happy. But... Uh, we begin to listen to people again. We, we pray with expectancy rather than out of fear. And we're replenished. 
And Jesus is a great model. The first example I want to give us is from uh, this time when his, his cousin John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, was beheaded by Herod. And Jesus he was pretty close to him as far as not being relationship close, but, but they were very similar in their mission. And John the Baptist understood, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, understands what Jesus is doing. And so this hits Jesus pretty hard. And I thought about that, you know, I thought if, if I had a pastor friend that the government arrested and cut off his head, what am I going to do? What's going to be my, where am I going to run to, you know? And I thought, well, I'd probably stay up all night, you know, watching the news, getting everything that I could off the web. The last thing that I would do is to say, I think I need to go away by myself and rest. I just worry that thing to death, you know, but not Jesus. This is what he does. Matthew 14, 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And the next, <laughs> you talk about him having pressure, or he having pressure. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Jesus gets into a boat. John the Baptist has is, is, had his head cut off. And Jesus says, I got to get away. He gets into a boat, go to a lonely place. And the crowds go, there he goes. Go get him. And they do. They go around the other side of the lake. And what happens next is that wonderful story about the feeding of the 5,000. You know, a huge uh, seafood buffet that Jesus lays out for everybody. You know? And he teaches them. And he gets right back into it. He engages with them again. And he knows where his strength, see, is, is coming from. And, and we say, well, yeah, but... I mean, he's God. I mean, that he, he's got an advantage over on us because I can't do that because he's God. And yes, but he's also fully human. And he knows what it is to get tired. He knows what it is to get disappointed. He knows what it is to have dreams that are crushed, just like we do. And, you know, we think, well, but uh, my expectations, boy, the pressure that's on me is huge. Well, listen, the pressure that was on Jesus was was pretty big too, you know? Can you imagine having on your to-do list every day of your life, you get up in the morning and you look at your to-do list and it says, save the world. There's your to-do list for the day. Save the world. Jesus had pressure. And that's why he knew that he needed to rest. So after they find him and, and he gives them that, uh, that wonderful meal, uh, he's engaged again, and right after that, it, we have Matthew 14, 23. It says, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. See, so he, he rests, he engages, he gets depleted again. He says, I, I've got to rest some more. And by rest, I don't just mean he's taking a nap, but obviously he's communing with his father. But you see, it's a, it's a spiritual and a physical thing. And then, you know, right after that, he feeds 5,000. He's got to go right back out and do it again. He didn't have to. It wasn't law. He knew that in order to be fruitful to produce, we have to have this life of rhythm, rest, recover, replenish, then re-engage. And I think that if we are Christ followers, that we will pay attention to this and try to pattern our lives after the life of Jesus. It's, it's not our energy that uh, impresses God, it's our living in the manner that he made us that will produce the fruit that's needed. So here's a question for you, or really a statement followed by a question. The statement is, can, you can move to a better place when you live at a sustainable pace. So maybe in our lives right now, yeah, we're in one of those seasons where it's rough and there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of tension. Now here's the word. We can move to a better place when we live at a sustainable pace. And the question for us constantly is, is my pace sustainable? Can I keep this up? You know, most of us 
can't assess this ourselves um, for some reason. Somebody else has to tell us. If you're married, um, it should be your mate, probably. If you're not married, it should be a close friend. But just ask them that question. Have I changed over the last few months? Have I changed over the last six years? Since, since I took this job, am I more angry? Do I not listen to you anymore? Um, do you see patterns in my life that have changed? You know, the answers to those questions will tell you if your uh, current pace is sustainable. Let someone else take your temperature for you. And then I would say that it's, that it's important that us, to us that we know the season that we're in. You know, every person goes through times or seasons when you really don't have the time for rest. And I, I want you to listen closely here. You know, you, you may have papers that are due. You may have projects that are due. You have, may, may have relationship issues that are demanding everything. Uh, maybe if you're, you know, if, if you're married and your, your spouse is sick or something that, you know, you got to step up. You just don't get the, the, the opportunity to rest like you should. And, and everybody has those times. Everybody has those seasons when you go through. And when, when you're, if you're going through one of those, um, you need to recognize that. And, you know, it's like if I could just live till June the 2nd, if I could just get to there. OK, so that's that's fine. Know that you if I can just get to June the 2nd, then life's going to be better. But when it gets to June the 2nd, you've also got to give yourself a season to do nothing. Then when you get there. OK, so that's where your balance comes in. Some sometimes we have to live in those seasons where we really don't get the opportunity uh, the way that we need to. And it's not that we're disobeying God. It's just that's just what life is. So I. I just want to encourage you to give yourself permission to do that, you know, that uh, you're not disbelieving God if you're in this huge season of engagement when it seems that every day has a list that just spills over into next month and, and you can't do it. The season has to end sometime. And then the last thing is I want to say that it's good for us to, it's, it's absolutely necessary for us to determine what is rest for us. You know, this isn't legalism here. This, this isn't law towards us. So, so how do you rest? Uh, it's, it's just pure grace. God wants you to be well. That means that you have to walk in this rhythm of how he's made us. If you, if you like to mow the lawn and it's Sunday and you should be keeping the Sabbath, but you like to mow the lawn, I say you ought to mow the lawn, Right? If that's what restores you, is sitting on your lawnmower for a couple of hours, go mow the lawn. That's what's rest to you, see? Don't accept someone else's rules for your rest. This is between you and God. It's not between the church and you or anyone else. This is between you and God. Those of us that are, ext us that are extroverts, we have trouble being alone. My idea of a day of rest is for me to take a nap for about a half an hour and then for me to go get around some people because, you see, I'm a feeder, I'm a parasite, and I need to go get some energy from someone else. And you lock me up by myself, I'll just get more and more tired. But an introverted person, that's what they need to do is they need to be by themselves because if I would... Say, let's go to the party. You know, I want to I want to get restored. That's not restored to an introverted person. And of course, as we're processing this news, most of us that are married are thinking, well, but my mate is the opposite of me. Well, that's usually the case. So there we there we have the the fun of marriage, you know, is determining how we can rest together. But the most important thing is to do it. You know, God has designed you to rest. And from that time of rest, God restores us so that you can move to a better place in your life, so you can give him joy, so you can be fruitful. Now, I've got three questions for us, and I put those in the bulletin. I sometimes like to give us questions to, to take home. Um, first one is, what is God saying to you about this? That's a real simple question. You know, what in the, you, you may be a person that, that's very much in rhythm and and you don't need to hear this sermon at all, but God, 
God says something to us all the time. So what's God saying to you about rest? And the, the second one is a little bit more confrontational. Is your current pace sustainable? If nothing changes in the way that you're living right now, is this just sustainable? If you're going to live, if you're going to move to a better place, remember, you have to live at a sustainable pace. And so maybe you're going through one of those seasons. It's just crazy. Uh, but you need to give yourself some space there. And the third question uh, how much how might you help someone else and if you're in all of our relationships uh, sometimes we can help someone else to have a a time of rest or a season of rest by not being um, as King Solomon called him the sluggard the the lazy person but sometimes we can we can help those who need rest by uh, doing some things ourselves to help them get there Okay, well, let's just sit in prayer for this for just a minute. As deep cries out